Welcome to Worship with Mount Hope Lutheran Church in West Dallas. If this is your first time with us, we are grateful that you found us and are joining us this time for worship. We celebrate the first weekend in Advent this day. And so if you have an Advent wreath at home, you are more than willing or more than uh, able to um, and invited to be a part of lighting that candle at home when we light the candles here at church. Blessed be God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, whose forgiveness is sure and whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Together, let us honestly and humbly confess that we have not lived as God desires. Loving and forgiving God, we confess, we confess that, that we are held captive by sin. sin. In, In spite, spite of our best efforts, we have, we have gone, gone astray. astray. We, we have, have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. neighbor. We, we have, have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake, wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Christ. Amen. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven and you are free, free from all that holds you back and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So I attended one of those financial seminars they offer to teach you about the importance of a 401k. I've had so much time to kill at home lately. Ever since I got my job furloughed, I've been searching every job board I can find for any tip I can get on how to make money and how to save it. I went down one of those rabbit holes on Google. You know what I'm talking about, where I searched how to pay off mountains of debt, and after watching more than 30 minutes of YouTube videos, I ended up signing up for a seminar. They were talking about compound interest and how you can build wealth over time, just by squirreling a little bit of it away every month. Apparently, the Italians thought, up, thought it up in the 17th century, and then Wall Street perfected it in our own time, and everyone should take advantage of it. I like the thought. So you deposit $200 a month in an account at a certain percent. The money collects interest. Then the interest collects on the interest. Don't worry, I'm not here to sell you a mutual fund. I mean, I don't even have one myself. I have four years of student loans to pay off and my car payments, so I'm definitely no financial whiz. But the concept is appealing. So say you deposit $200 into the mutual fund at a decent rate of return. You do that every month for 30 years and voila, you're a millionaire. Awesome idea, right? Guess how I felt though after the sales pitch. Here I am without a job, 
with a big pile of debt, wishing that before I leased a car, someone had taught me about money in high school, had told me to put the car payment into a mutual fund instead. As you can imagine, I started to feel a bit discouraged. There's nothing like having a lot of time on your hands, a search engine on your smartphone, and aimlessly searching the internet. I've never really done this before, but I was feeling so down, I decided to type four letters into the search bar. Can you guess what they were? H-O-P-E. Where can I find hope? It's kind of embarrassing because I know where to find hope. I didn't find hope in my Google search, I can tell you that. But as I walked to the verge of self-condemnation and regret, wishing I had a job and that I'd been smarter with my money, I stopped my little pity party and walked out the door for some fresh air. I found myself at the mailbox. To my surprise, the Christmas card for my grandma had arrived, just like every other year. A sweet little note with $10 in it. And the front of the card said, hope of the world. When I turned it over, on the inside was a drawing of Mary holding the little baby Jesus in that verse from Luke. But Mary treasured all these words in her heart, pondering what they might mean. And there I stood in the snow without a jacket on, holding the card and the envelope in one hand, $10 bill in the other. I looked up at the sky and I had to laugh. Snow was falling all around me in those big fat flakes that are as big as dove feathers. And I suddenly felt like the richest person in the world. Right then and there, I repeated and asked God to forgive me for getting so discouraged about my circumstances when his son and his spirit live right inside of me. What a treasure there is here in my little heart of mine. Mary treasured up all the things that God was doing in her circumstances in her heart. This miracle of a story that God sent his only son into the world, born of a woman, born as a baby, to live a perfect life and set us free from sin and despair. Wow. That miracle of a story has been treasured in hearts like Mary's ever since the day Jesus was born. And since Luke wrote down his gospel, and the words were passed along through the centuries, just think of the compound interest that's accumulated in the hearts of believers. Oh, the riches of the glory of God in all of us in this world. As I stood in the snow, and believe me, I was really starting to get cold, I had this desire to just store it up and let the truth of God multiply and grow so that my whole heart becomes a reservoir of hope. Let it compound and accumulate. But friends, I have to tell you, I felt something else so deeply. Like my grandma, who was by the world's standards, had very little, but gives so much, so that her $10 gift each year feels to me like 10000 We must not just hoard all this hope to ourselves. Spend it. Give it away. The world needs it. If you and I, believers in God, get discouraged in these days, how much more do those who don't yet know him need hope? Go tell it on the mountains. Shout it from your rooftop. Ponder the words of God's truth and in the wealth and riches build up inside of you. Give that hope away. Today, I choose to light the candle of Advent because Christ has made me rich and the news of his birth is so good that I must proclaim it. Today, I share the riches of hope. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray together. Stir up, Stir up your, your power, power, Lord Christ, Lord Christ and, and come. come. By, By your, your merciful protection, protection awaken us to the threatening dangers of our sins, and keep us blameless until the coming of your new day. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading today is from the 64th chapter of Isaiah. 
Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your, known, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who you remember in your ways, but you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Gospel according to Mark, the 13th chapter. Jesus said, In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great glory, great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree you learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Be 
If you can, gather any children in the area in to uh, listen to a book. This is called The Sparkle Box. It's written by Jill Hardy and illustrated by Christine Kornacki. Dear reader, you are the light of the world. Make it sparkle. Snowflakes swirled through the air as Sam and his mom stopped to look in the toy store window. With Christmas only a few weeks away, Sam needed to make his Christmas list. He tugged on his mom's sleeve and pointed to the train. He loved the shiny red engine. Later, as Sam and his mom curled up on the couch to read a Christmas book, something sparkly on the mantel caught his eye. Mom, is that a present for me? He asked. Sam's mom tussled his hair. It's a special gift called a, Christmas, called a sparkle box. We'll open it together later, but we need to fill it first. Sam was excited, but it was hard to wait. Driving home from school the next day, Sam's mom stopped at a building he had never been to before. She asked him to help her carry in some food and blankets. Sam peeked into the bag he was carrying and noticed a box of macaroni and cheese, his favorite. What are we going to do with this stuff, Mom? She smiled and said, we're giving it to people who don't have enough food to eat or blankets to keep them warm. But inside the building, Sam didn't see anyone who looked cold or hungry, just a nice lady with a big smile who thanked them. I think her name was Donna. On the way home, they drove by the park it was dusk and the pretty Christmas lights had just come on. As they stopped at a traffic light, Sam noticed someone on a bench curled up and sleeping. His mother noticed too. That's someone who may get one of your blankets, she said softly. He doesn't have anywhere to live. Sam felt bad. It would be sad not to have a home to live in. Sam hung up his coat. It was good to be home. As he sat in the, at the kitchen table to have a snack, he noticed the sparkle box gleaming on the mantel. Mom, did you put in anything in the sparkle box yet? He asked shyly. Well, actually I did put something in it today, she answered, but it's still not ready to open. We need to add a couple more things to it. Sam wondered what was inside. The days flew by, and soon it was time for one of Sam's favorite events, the Christmas party at his dad's office. There was always lots of delicious food and a present for every child at the party. Sam's dad thanked everyone for coming. He talked about how blessed they were when many people in the world struggle for something as simple as clean water to drink. He said a village in Africa would receive a special gift this year thanks to money donated by employees and their families. The gift was a well and would provide clean water for the entire village. Sam asked his mom if his family helped. Yes, dear, we did. He looked around, the grown-ups were smiling, but he saw tears too. Happy tears, his mom whispered. As his dad tucked him into bed that night, Sam thought about his Christmas list, and that reminded him of another present. Daddy, did you and Mom fill up the sparkle box yet? Sam asked. Well, we added something to it tonight, but it's still not ready to be opened. Sam drifted off to sleep, imagining what could be inside. A few days later, Sam was filled with excitement as he shopped with his mom. Today was his school party. Then there was a Christmas tree called a mitten tree where the kids could hang mittens, hats, scarves for people who needed them. Sam picked out the biggest pair of mittens he could find. He also bought a candy bar for himself with his own money. When he turned to leave, Sam heard the tinkling of bells. He looked up and saw the man from the park bench coming in the door. The man seemed tired. Sam looked at the candy bar in his hand 
and thought about the mittens in his bag. He looked at the man's hands. They looked cold. Sam's heart began to pound. As, a, as quick as a wink, Sam slipped his candy bar into the bag with his, the mitten and pressed the bag into the man's hands. Sam ran out the door shouting, Merry Christmas! His mom gave him a hug. I'm proud of you, she whispered. I know that wasn't easy, but you thought a little, brought a little light in his, to his world tonight. Sam asked his mom if they could drive by the park. As he watched the flame on a giant candle blink on and off, he thought about how unfair it was that some people didn't have a home to live in or food to eat. Soon it was Christmas Eve, the most special night of the year. Sam and his family gathered at their church for a Christmas Eve service. They sang songs and listened to the story of the first Christmas. Then, in the darkened sanctuary, a single candle was lit. That candle was used to light other candles, and soon everyone was carefully passing the flame from one person to the next until the whole room was filled with a magical light. Sam looked around. How lovely, how peaceful they all looked as they shared the light. On Christmas morning, Sam ran downstairs as fast as he could. Under the tree was the train with the shiny red engine. And what was that? The sparkle box, too? Sam could hardly wait to open it. He sat on his mom's lap with his dad snuggled in close. Sam slowly lifted the lid of the box. Inside, there were just a few pieces of paper with words written on them. Puzzled, he took the paper out and began to read the words out loud. Mittens and a candy bar given to someone in need. Warm blankets and food for the homeless. A well in Africa that will provide clean drinking water. Sam's mom explained, Sam, the sparkle box is our gift to Jesus on Christmas Day, his birthday. Sam was confused, but we didn't give Jesus a gift. We gave things to people who needed him. His mom smiled. You're right, and no gift could make Jesus happier. He taught us that where, whatever we do for people in need, we do for him. So each year, we'll think of some special gift to give Jesus. We'll write down these gifts and put them in the sparkle box. On Christmas morning, we'll open the box and read out loud the gifts we gave in honor of his birthday. Sam thought about the man curled up on the park bench, the mittens and the cold, soft blankets, the well that would bring clean water to a village in Africa. He looked at his mom and smiled through tears. Happy tears, Sam whispered. This is a sparkle box that you can find. There's a website listed on the screen. The sparklebox.com is the website. Um, so you can buy them there, but maybe you don't want to do that. Sometimes you might have a box at home and some glitter or some shiny things, and I made this one for myself. And so find a sparkle box and start putting gifts for Jesus in that box. In our text from chapter 64 of Isaiah, we hear the people once again lamenting to God. Why? Well, the writings we find in the final 11 chapters of Isaiah, what we refer to as third Isaiah, seem to deal with the challenges that the Israelites faced during the Persian period. Some of the Hebrew people who had been displaced from Jerusalem during the Babylonian aggression and subsequent exile had now returned to Jerusalem under Persian sponsorship. Those who were left behind during the exile, those who had held the fort, so to speak, clashed with the returnees to Jerusalem over questions of status, social standing, political and religious authority, 
Persia remained, as colonizers, the real mediator of power. This local tension reveals how a colonizing power can alter group identity. In this case, not only how the people related to them, the colonizers, but also to one another, those who stayed and those who returned. With the rebuilding of the temple, which families would carry out the priestly duties? Who had the political authority? Does the Davidic covenant that someone from the line of David would always be on the throne still stand? Many of these issues are addressed up front in chapter 63. But here in chapter 64, there are still questions about the identification of different groups. The people who are lamenting are asking God to demonstrate God's divine power and might to adversaries or enemies. Are such enemies internal or external to Israel? Whatever the case, they want God to send disasters and convince them to change. How many of us have ever prayed that way? For a disaster or something bad to come upon those we don't like in order to get them out of the way or teach them a lesson? In verse 5, however, the tone and focus changes from enemies to Israelites themselves and how they have sinned against God. They then plead to God not to be angry, to forget about their sins, to remember all the people of Israel. Curiously, verses 12, 10 through 11 were left out by the lectionary gurus. They read, your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Z Jerusalem, a de de desolation. Our holy and beautiful house, where our ancestors praised you, has been burned by fire, and all our pleasant places have become ruins. After all this, will you restrain yourself, O Lord? Will you keep silent and punish us so severely? They were some pretty scary times for the people their temple is gone. The place where they gathered for worship and to make sacrifice was in ruins. What were they to do now? We hear a similar theme in the gospel text. Early in chapter 13, Jesus has told his disciples that the great buildings that the disciples point to will have all their stones thrown down, warns them about false prophets, about wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nations, earthquakes and famines, persecutions and beatings for his believers, family disputes, all kinds of suffering. Sounds like some pretty nasty stuff going on and the disciples wonder when all of that will take place. They are likely worried about the same things as the Israelites. What would they do with a temple gone and everything they had known in ruins? How soon would it happen? Would they have to endure it themselves? Then Jesus said, In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. I'm not sure all that is helpful, especially when later he also adds that no one will know exactly when it will all take place. Uncertainty is always scary, isn't it? Our own time and context, we have our own scary, nasty stuff going on around us. Distress among family members and friends during political discussions. There is still debate, uncertainty, and animosity surrounding the election. Multiple tropical storms and hurricanes have devastated parts of the Gulf Coast and eastern states. Wildfires have raged in California, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. Fear and frustration from being isolated, not being able to do the things that we want to do the way we want to do them, not being in a sanctuary, a temple, in ruins, perhaps. What do we hear that is helpful? Back to Isaiah. It is interesting that in the middle of their lamenting, their confessing, their sinfulness, their worry about the future, they remind God, Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hands. You know who God, they know who God is, their creator, 
And they know what God has done and is able to do. And so they remind God. But I wonder if it should have been more of a reminder to themselves of those things. I have some clay here. I want you, if you've got clay, go grab it. But I want you to just otherwise imagine that you're, you've got a lump of clay, moldable modeling clay in your, hat, in your hand. Perhaps you recall playing with it as a child. What color is it? This one's yellow, but I have some blue and some red and some green up here. What are you forming from it? When I was young, I made a dog and a turtle, not out of modeling clay, but out of a clay that was put in a kiln where it was heated and dried and made hard. Can't reshape them. My late husband, Leif, when I first met him, had done quite a bit of work with clay. He had thrown pots and vases and bowls and pictures. He had even made a whole dinnerware set. The clay he used was shaped by his hands, glazed and fired into usable vessels. Yet those vessels, these vessels that he made, can't be remolded or reshaped. Modeling clay stays soft, so it can be remade again and again into something different. When God made the first humans, God took earth or clay and formed them. God forms all of us all humanity, into different shapes and colors and sizes, but doesn't put us in a kiln to make us hard, but leaves us all soft and shape shapeable. As you ponder God's creation, imagine squishing that clay. Feel its movement between your fingers. That is us, clay in God's hand, able to be molded as God sees fit. God isn't finished with us yet. I believe that God has unique clay in us. Sometimes we are meant to be vessels, like these vases, to hold whatever gifts from God we are meant to hold. But unlike the clay that Leif used that was fired and hardened, God can and does reshape us into pouring vessels, like a picture, to pour out that which God has put inside of us. God's mercy, God's love, God's spirit of guidance and encouragement. Our hearts are not meant to be hardened by the suffering and hardships that we have been facing, all the challenges that we have been facing in our lives, especially this past year, but are meant to be soft and pliable, ready to be shaped in the best way to receive and to pour out what God has in store for us and for those around us. God not only has the power to mold us but actually wants to mold us into God's own image and likeness. That is a reality that becomes awesomely apparent when God molds God's self at Christmas into a poor, displaced baby in a manger. God becomes clay in Jesus Christ. It is that same Jesus Christ who issued this promise. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Christ, for whom we wait, has already been and continues to be with us forever. He is walking beside us, loving us, having compassion for us, even in, especially in, our times of trouble, frustration, and fear. He comes to us again and again in the word, in prayer, but most especially in the face of others. Jesus urges us to be aware, keep alert, for the time is coming. So often during Advent, it is easy for, us, easy for us to only think of his coming as getting ready to celebrate Jesus' birth at Christmas. But I think that this is a message for us daily, to keep awake for his coming to us every day, everywhere we go, physically or virtually. Where do we meet Christ? How is God trying to reshape us during and by those encounters? In what manner is God trying to use us to share the good news of Christ's coming with others? It may be more difficult for us to think about that as we are physically distanced, but we still have interactions with or on behalf of others. Do we see Christ in them? Can we be Christ to them? 
May we all yield ourselves as moldable clay in God's hands, that God may best use us to encourage those around us to keep awake for the good news of Christ that is before us each and every day. Amen. God of power and might, tear open the heavens and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. We pray for the ministry we share in Christ's name. Open our hearts to your call for justice, peace, and healing. Open our hearts to the needs of the world as you draw near. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is, is great. great. We pray for this planet in need of restoration for devastated habitats, polluted waters, thawing ice, blazing fires, swelling floods, and long-lasting droughts. Renew the face of the earth and our relationship to it. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. We pray for all people who care for others in our community and around the world, especially medical workers and first responders. Gather supportive forces around them, Bring them the supplies they need to do their jobs safely and cover them with your healing when they feel defeated and overwhelmed. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. We pray for people who are in crisis as the seasons change, for those without homes facing severe weather, for those who are unemployed or underemployed, and for those in poverty or facing food insecurity. Relieve their burdens, sustain their bodies, and ease their minds. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. We pray for the people in our families and in this congregation who live with depression, anxiety, chronic pain, addiction, and other invisible illnesses. Ease their suffering and support them when they struggle. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. great. We give thanks for the lives and witness of those who died while waiting for justice, peace, or healing, those whose names we know and those whose names are known only to you. 
Sustain all who still yearn for the completion of your redeeming work. Hear us, O God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And, and also, also with you. We again take time to thank you for the many ways that you support the ministry of Mount Hope Lutheran Church by your prayers, by your emails of encouragement, by your financial donations. Your offerings can be mailed in, you can sign up for electronic giving, or you can donate online on the Mount Hope website. Um, there's a button there you can click and it will take all your information and your donation will be made. And um, as we are grateful, Donna has things to share from Hope Ministries. Just want to share with you that we had a successful distribution of 70 Thanksgiving meals to our Hope Ministries families. Um, about 30 of those were delivered. I want to thank um, Edward and my husband Dave and daughter Carly for helping to drive around to deliver those. Um, and all the volunteers who helped to put the boxes together, especially Linda Helminski, who was in charge of the food pantry, but who did a fabulous job uh, gathering up all of the supplies and organi organizing us. There were lots and lots of smiles on people's faces because they know that um, when they receive this turkey, they're probably going to have some leftovers too, and they were really super happy about that. We are just a little bit short of our funds. We thank everyone who's donated so far. Um, but if you still care to donate to help support uh, the food baskets, you can still do that. Uh, and that will go into our Hope Ministries Fund. The next big event is Christmas Toys on Saturday, December 5th. So that'll be next Saturday. Uh, in the parking lot between 10 and noon, we'll be gathering Christmas toys for distribution. Uh, we're looking especially for sports balls, for um, uh, kids that are older, also for toys for younger kids, um, cars and trucks and baby dolls and building blocks and things like that. So we'll be there on December 5th from 10 to noon. Thank you so much for helping us at this special time of year. Thanks, Dana. We do thank everybody at Hope Ministries for the volunteers for all that they do as well. Let us pray. Generous God, you have created all that is and you provide for us in every season. Bless all that we offer that through these gifts, the world will receive your blessing. In the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, who taught us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The creator of the stars, bless your advent waiting. The long-expected Savior, fill you with love. The unexpected Spirit, guide your journey, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
reminder that you may join us for Zoom Bible study on Thursday afternoons or for uh, Zoom coffee hour on Sunday mornings at 10.30. Um, the information for those can be found on the church's website. We will also be doing midweek uh, Lenten services. They will be very brief, but we Advent hope, services. Or, I mean, Advent <laughs> services. Goodness gracious. I yes. think I'm back in Don't March jump or want to be ahead. We're not ready yet. <laughs> <laughs> and who doesn't want to yeah. be ahead? But yes, for Advent service, midweek Advent services, where we will be lighting the Advent wreath again. Um, and so you're invited to have an Advent wreath on your table as you watch uh, midweek. So please tune in for those as well. And a reminder, next Saturday, the toy drop-off. So keep all of those things on your calendar. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. everybody. Have a good week. Stay safe. Be healthy.